as you as as will told you i'm a cardiac surgeon i i, I do mainly uh, valve surgery in daily clinical life but i also do a lot of research on uh, all kind of new develop developments within the heart valve disease uh, sector so i'm heavily involved in, in heart valve disease uh, have been always throughout my my whole career but of course the 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 topic specifically for today I mean, we are living, yeah, we are living in a slightly different world today. And uh, also heart valve disease, heart valve operations and everything regarding around that has been affected by this, by this um, COVID pandemia. And um, so, yes, also amongst us, amongst experts, amongst surgeons, amongst cardiologists, we have been doing a lot of online meetings uh, lately and recently to talk about this to 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 see first of all how all the different countries are handling it are facing the the, pro the problems we have now with covid and we are thinking about the future uh, because we are going to wake up i'm pretty sure we're going to wake up in a world that is still different than what we were used to and i think we're gonna have to adapt and we're gonna have to change many things in order to get uh, patient care back uh, up and running. I'm gonna try, I did prepare a few slides and I'm gonna try to share my screen uh, because like I mentioned, uh, can you see this? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. I had just a few slides. I mean, this is a sort of overview and I, these are some slides that I took from a, from a presentation that was done on a webinar only like uh, three or four weeks ago when we were talking amongst cardiac surgeons and also some cardiologists about the whole uh, situation, about the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemia. Um, you see some numbers here and the graphs are really taking at, um, at some of the peak moments of the number of infections throughout Europe. I think um, it is sort of settling down in Europe now. I can speak for all the countries, of course, but we are certainly in Belgium, it's settling down. Uh, even the, um, the countries that were hit the hardest, like Italy and Spain, uh, these people are coming out again, people are returning to work. Um, uh, also in the hospitals, things start to get back to normal, but they still are not far from, they are far from normal as we speak now. Of course, we have different containment measures still ongoing in most countries. Uh, but anyway, the most countries approaching, uh, are approaching the, the end of the first peak and we all hope that we, yeah, some people say there will be a second wave uh, and we only have to wait for the magnitude and the timing of that. But uh, all of this, of course, is still uh, unsure. Um, as you all know, there are uh, different policies decided on national level or on regional level. Um, I think there is a lot going on about testing and tracing of patients, but as you all know, I mean, all the tests that we do all have their drawbacks. I mean, uh, even if you test negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have COVID. There are a lot of, lot of sensitivity problems in, those, in these tests that we do. So there are still many, many more question marks in this whole situation than there are answers for the moment. And this also reflects on our activity in cardiac surgery and on heart valve surgery or heart valve disease uh, in general. Just to give you a flavor, what was the situation in Belgium? Uh, just to give you an update we had, Belgium was hit quite hard as well. Uh, we had over 55,000 people infected. We, we are a small country of only 11 million inhabitants. We had more than 9,000 deaths, which is high. Um, I have to say that the government decided to count all the deaths that occurred in elderly facilities, also as COVID-related deaths. So maybe we are slightly overestimating the number of deaths in, in Belgium in that way. But anyway, I think there is a, certainly a significant amount of uh, extra people dying than what we see normal in any flu uh, or any um, um, uh, other regular flu season. Uh, on the peak moment, we had more than 17,000 people hospitalized, more than 1,000 on intensive care. But, and this is important for cardiac surgery, uh, in the beginning of the pandemia, we rapidly 
increased our ICU capacity in Belgium. So we, we have a constant capacity. We have a lot of hospitals in Belgium, slightly too many, I have to say. And we have already around 1,000, 1,200 intensive care beds. But we rapidly increased that to more than 2,000 beds. And this gave us the opportunity to always have some ICU capacity available, even on the top moment of the, of the pandemic. The figures below you see are our own data, and this is at the peak moment. We had around 100 people hospitalized, a lot of people on intensive care, a lot of people ventilated, and also some people on ECMO, which is a supporting system um, for people who are really in a bad, a bad situation. Of course, when we think about what has changed on cardiology and cardiac surgery and how it has affected our daily activity in Belgium, I made a slight overview of that. Um, because of the things that I explained to you that we had in Belgium, the sort of the luxury of a relatively high intensive care capacity, we never had to stop completely. And this was important, I think, because in many, in many countries, like in Italy, in Spain, um, they were really, the intensive care was overwhelmed, was overwhelmed. And so some centers really had to stop all activity. Some of the smaller hospitals in Belgium also were in the same situation, everything on intensive care full, no possibility for any cardiac surgery activity. This was not the case in our center. We, we never stopped completely. And in the early days or in the peak days of the pandemia, we still could do like one or two cases per day. Of course, then we gave preference to urgent or emergent cases uh, only, but there were also some, some patients with like severe symptoms and uh, who, where it was not wise to postpone the operation. We still, we still could offer heart valve surgery for those patients. Now for the moment, we are working at around 50 to 60%. It's slightly increasing up to 75% up to of normal activity, uh, but it's still not 100%. And um, this is uh, what people are seeing through across Europe. When I talk to colleagues from Germany, from Italy, from Spain, all, all across the Europe, uh, nobody is back to normal as we speak right now. So we are still all at reduced rates of cardiac surgery capacity or cardiac surgery patients, heart valve patients being operated on a daily basis. ICU capacity is available and in many countries it's becoming more and more available. Uh, and still in a lot of centers and a lot of countries, they give priority to like urgent cases or emergent cases. Um, the elective cases that we do are increasing we weekly now, but we still are slightly focusing on patients who can use a, like a fast track regime. Fast track means that these are patients who can go to a normal, regular recovery and don't need intensive care uh, for a long time or only for a very short time. So these patients do not occupy intensive care and so they are not uh, causing any problems in case there should be a second wave or a second uh, increase in, in COVID patients. What we do now, we do screen all the patients who come in. And of course, this is sort of, yeah, it's a bit tedious. It's a bit cumbersome for a lot of patients because all of our patients who come in, they have to come in very early on the day and they are screened. They get a swab in their nose, a nose test. And then they have to wait for like three or four hours to the result of this test. And then we know that the patient is negative and then we can go on with regular admission and then we can do the surgery the next uh, day. So this is what is happening now. Of course, we know that this screening this, like I say, is not perfect. There's like 50, 60, no, 40 to 50% false negative results. So we still have a possibility that people who are really positive for COVID-19 uh, get through this test and get on the operating table. But yeah, this is a risk we are taking for the moment. Um, it, it didn't cause any major problems uh, for the moment as we speak. We, I personally, and we in our center, we have no experience doing urgent cardiac surgery in a, in a patient who is really COVID positive, who is really suffering from COVID because of course, I think across Europe, there has been some cases there have been cases from patients who are infected, 
who have COVID-19, who are in a bad shape and also have severe valve disease. But I learn and I hear from colleagues that cardiac surgery in these patients did not went well. These are very sick patients. They are in a bad shape. And then doing a big operation, uh, long procedures, heart valve procedures, it can cause a lot of problems. So it is not advisable to do cardiac surgery or certainly complex cases in COVID-19 positive patients. What we do see now, and this is very strange because as I told you, we are slowly increasing our activity. We are went from to 50% to 60 to 75% now. And we are slowly getting back to our normal regular activity and regular workload. But our waiting list has dropped. So the people, normally we have a constant waiting list of around 250 patients who are actively waiting. Some of them, of course, are more urgent than others. There are a lot, a lot of patients in valve disease who are quite stable and they can wait like six weeks or three months or even longer. But the waiting list has, has not disappeared, but it has certainly dropped to around 150. Of course, there's many reasons for that. And you see them, some of them listed there. Of course, the cardiologists have stopped their activity for like six weeks or two months. So the regular outpatient clinics have stopped. The echo exams have stopped. Um, uh, there was no outpatient consultation and so on and so on. So this has really had a severe effect on patients getting listed on the waiting list. There are some patients who refuse to come to the hospital right now. There are certainly patients who have only minor symptoms of relatively no, low symptoms. They, they stay at home. Uh, people don't have to go to work during the quarantine. So there are, sometimes they, they simply refuse to, to come in to do any exams or to do any um, uh, outpatient clinic consultation. Of course, there are also patients ignoring symptoms, and this is more dangerously, of course, because we did see, it's not a major effect for the moment, but we did see some patients who waited really too long. And then uh, we who had chest pain, who had uh, like um, um, uh, pre, pre uh, almost fainting uh, symptoms and so on, and who slightly ignored that. And then eventually they do come to the emergency room and sometimes in a bad shape. But I have to say, this is still not, this is for the moment, not a, a huge effect. We see some isolated cases in those uh, situations, but it's not a huge, huge effect. And of course, also patients delay, like I mentioned, cardiology uh, checkups. So this is a sort of, of, of summary. I mean, um, COVID-19 in, in Belgium, but this is the, the case in many European countries, there were a lot of containment measures taken quite early. ICU capacity in Belgium was never saturated, so we could keep on going with some regular activity. Um, uh, we saw, of course, uh, in the first phase, a lot of reduction of the most elective uh, activities. There, are, there is certainly delayed presentation of patients with urgent and emergency cardiac uh, problems. Now we see not only our activity is increasing again, but also the cardiologists and the interventional cardiologists are uptaking, are gradually increasing their activity again. And so they are getting back also to like 60, 70%, not 100% yet. And there is certainly, there is more and more opening of outpatient uh, services. Um, what also dramatically changed for us and this is, there are some good things and there are some bad things about that. Amongst us, uh, amongst physicians, we have a dramatic increase in the use of teleconferencing. We do now the hard team conferences go online through teleconference. And due to the quality of these conferences, like this, like a Zoom call, this goes well. You can share videos, you can share, share echoes, you can share CAT exams, and so on and so on. So the teleconferencing, among physicians is really up to speed and it does provide the same quality as a hard team decision, as a hard team discussion, uh, seeing each other face to face. And I think this is very important for us. Towards patients, we start using telemedicine, but this is still in a very, for Belgium, in a very early days. So when patients are either having difficulties to come to the hospital or they refuse to come to the hospital, we can call them. 
We can call them on the phone. We can even do some video conferencing and we are certainly uh, planning on increasing that kind of activity in the next few weeks and months to keep the flow going and to, to, to reach out to patients to, to, um, to get rid of this um, uh, problem of patients refusing to come to the, to the hospital. Of course, we have been focusing first um, on, on, when you talk about valve disease, on patients with the most critical problems like severe aortic stenosis. There are many forms of heart valve disease who are much more stable and where we don't have, um, uh, where we have more time um, to, for delay. But something like severe aortic stenosis, of course, is, is, uh, can be critical, it can be um, more important. And we are more and more investigating more, uh, like I say, structured pathways for symptomatic patients, like also using more and more telemedicine and uh, reaching out to patients at home so that ca they can share their complaints and that we can help them uh, to get uh, medical help as needed. So that was it, guys. That was my presentation. Thank you.